Thank you for joining us for the Meet VCU Authors at the Humanities Research Center. My name is Eli Clawson. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at VCU and the acting associate director of the Humanities Research Center for the spring of this year. First, I'd like to thank the College of Humanities and Sciences and the amazing Ronnie Sisabath and the new acting director for the spring, also Chris Shin, for their support and help with the promotion of this event. For those of you who are new to this series, our Meet the VCU Authors series invites faculty, students, and members of the Richmond community to come meet VCU authors as they talk about their recent publications and answer questions about their work. It's also a time of celebration as we know that every book takes many years to complete. Our virtual events follow a fairly similar format. Um, I obviously am introducing our guest who is going to talk for about 40 to 45 minutes and then we'll time, have time for questions from the audience. So you can post your questions both during and after the talk using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Today's speaker is Chris Irving, Assistant Professor of Communication Arts at VCU. Chris delves into the history of two related media, superhero comic books and film. In his latest book, Cliffhanger. Um, and prior to that, he's written several articles on co comic book history, as well as the books The Blue Beetle Companion, Conversations, Larry Hama, Conversations, Michael Alfred, Leaping Tall Buildings, The Origins of American Comics, and Comics NYC for the French Market. Chris currently teaches visual communications in the communications art department, as well as topics, courses on Star Wars, Batman, and what he calls techno dystopia. Irving is also a student in the media arts and text program, and he is on track to defend his dissertation in summer 2024. Today's talk celebrates the publication of his book, Cliffhanger, Cinematic Superheroes of the Serials, 1941 to 1952, published in June of last year by Tomorrow's Publishing. His book explores the origin on the first on-screen superheroes and the comic creators and filmmakers who brought them to life. Chris, congratulations on the book and welcome to VCU Meet the Authors. Yes, thank you so much for having me. So a little bit about Cliffhanger before I start discussing it. Um, this is the actual copy. It is a, a hardcover. Um, my first, no, it's not my first hardcover. It's my first hardcover with this publisher. Um, I started working on Cliffhanger back in 2006 when I uh, had finished um, the publishing history of a character called the Blue Beetle. And I finished an early draft of it in 2009, and it kind of sat on the back burner for a little bit. I revisited it a few years ago and found that the research was so much, there was so much more available because of all of our online resources. And so I'm very, very happy with this book and I'm very proud of it. Um, it basically intersects the origin of the superheroes in comic books um, that's not counting characters like the Shadow or the Phantom, but just specifically comic book superheroes with the juvenile sound serial of the 1930s and 40s. Um, so for today, I'm mostly going to cover on the serial, cover the serial perspective because there are some pretty crazy fun stories from that uh, that era. So if you will uh, just hold on tight, um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions afterwards. Um, big thanks to designer Rich Falks, who uh, is one of my best collaborators and came up with these beautiful interior designs. Um, the cover is designed by Michael Cronenberg. We really wanted this to have a feeling of an old film magazine. Uh, I wrote this book for uh, people who were coming in new to both media. Um, and I figured the the folks who had been, you know, discovering the serials on um, actual film prints in the 1960s 
I wanted to let them know that I was thinking of them. So that's why the design is kind of a, a wink and a nod and uh, hopefully a huge hug to all of the um, their compassion and excitement about the media. All right, so um, the movie serial format actually started as a silent. Um, Thomas Edison debuted a 12 reel serial um, called What Happened to Mary? in 1912, with stories appearing concurrently in Ladies World magazine. The serial's first major commercial success came with 1913's The Adventures of Kathleen. The first chapter debuted on December 29th, 1913, and ran until July the next year. Um, now, it's so important that the difference between what happened to Mary and The Adventures of Kathleen is um, what happened to Mary was more of a series, right? They were chapter plays, um, but there wasn't an immediate um, kind of what we're going to call a cliffhanger ending. Um, the Adventures of Kathleen, however, uh, did actually enact the cliffhanger. It followed a loyal daughter trying to save her retired Kentucky colonel father from an unscrupulous native chief. Um, again, you know, 1910s, we are dealing in stereotypes and uh, unfavorable depictions. The whole point of the cliffhanger was to create a hook to get the audiences to come back the next week to see how the protagonist would escape certain death, even by literally hanging off of a cliff. Um, hence the term, obviously. But you also had, you know, the girl uh, kind of snidely whiplash type stuff. The girl tied up on the train tracks and a train is coming. Um when Colonel William N. Selig of the Selig Polyscope Company announced his plans to produce Kathleen, William Randolph Hearst's newspaper Empire approached him about sponsoring the series and cross-promoting it through their Chicago newspapers. So the Chicago Tribune swooped in and grabbed the contract out from under Hearst and created a short-lived model for serial production. Newspaper sponsorship uh, benefited from cross promotion far stronger than word of mouth or a small ad. So basically, um, they would do these pro summaries of each chapter. Uh, so if you missed a chapter in theaters, you could read it. Uh, but it was also a way to create awareness of the film to um, audiences. The pro's counterpart chapters garnered the Tribune approximately 50,000 new readers. The next year, in 1914, saw The Perils of Pauline, um, starring Pearl White, who was really the first movie serial queen. The significance of Perils of Pauline is that it really ratcheted up the death-defying stunt work, much of which was actually by Pearl White herself. Um, Perils of Pauline is really uh, the legendary silent film serial. There were so many, so many other serials, and they would typically have a chapter end um, with, you know, a cliffhanger at the end of a chapter and the subsequent chapter picking up to show how the heroine, in most cases, escaped death, which is either apparent or anticipated. Um, sometimes it turns out the hero didn't really blow up. Um, it was something I, I never revealed escape that they would they would cheat and they would put it in the uh, opening of the next chapter. There was also this very deus ex machina way of them being saved by someone at the end as well. Even Harry Houdini got into it with the master mystery. Um, I love to show <laughs> there's like one or two surviving chapters. Uh, the the robot is is just I love to show this one to my students. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about comics. Um, at this point in 1935, the movie serial, the silent film serial, had given way to um, the feature length film, um, which then um, kind of killed that, that genre. In 1935, former pulp writer and soldier Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, inspired by famous funnies and other books that reprinted comic strips, began national allied publications. His first title, which had original content, was titled New Fun. Um, it was an oversized comics magazine. It is the first comic book of all original material. Retitled More Fun Comics, it is also the first title of the company now known as DC Comics. 
And then we have these two young lads from Cleveland, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Um, they are most famous for having created Superman, which was published in 1938. Um, so the thing with Nicholson is that he uh, published Detective Comics in 1936. It's the first comic book to feature uh, and follow a specific genre. Uh, but he was squeezed out of the company by both his printer and distributor, Harry Donenfeld and Jack Leibowitz. Um, they basically took the company over, lock, stock, and barrel, and um, inherited much of his talent, including Siegel and Schuster, who had been doing some work for the major. The major had expressed interest in a failed comic strip pitch for Superman by Siegel and Schuster, but it was Donenfeld who would move in and procure it for his new series, Action Comics. Um, I, one of the things I love about this cover is, uh, you know, for years I was just like, oh, this is exciting. It's the first appearance of Superman. And I showed it in my comic book history class. This is like five years ago. And one of my students was like, he just likes like some dude beating up someone's car. I'm like, oh my gosh, I never thought of it that way. I look at it with the context of this being Superman as if uh, kids at the newsstand would have known who Superman was. Um, but when you really kind of look at it going in blind, it's kind of like Superman, I'm kind of a jerk. You know, he's like, he's wrecking th this car and these poor guys are fleeing in terror. But anyways, either way you look at it, it is the first appearance of Superman. Um, Superman was not really the first superhero in the sense that characters like the Phantom, who debuted a few years before in comic strips, had been. But the thing with Superman is he was the first comic book superhero. And I would even argue that Superman being such a weird um, kind of combination of different genres and influences is what made him work for early comic books, which were still kind of a punk rock medium when they, well, I think they're, they can still be a punk rock medium. But that's another conversation altogether. Um, in his first appearance, we really didn't know what Krypton was called. Um, it's a simple, a simple panel of, um, you know, a scientist placed his infant son within a hastily devised spaceship launching it towards Earth. That's it. That's all kids got on Superman's origin. Um, the focus was on the action. Um, the origin was then later expanded upon um, where we get the, the name of the planet Krypton and we witness the Kents um, finding a baby Superman or Cal L as he's become known by the side of um, a field and eventually adopting him. Um, but Superman really was, you know, the spark that it just ignited the comics industry. Um, it ignited an entire genre. And so the superhero genre really um, kind of came, didn't come into being necessarily, but I think it really blew up within comics and it really started to develop. So what's happened in the meantime to movie serials? Well, they started um, with a sound serial called The Indians or, or Indians Are Coming. Um, again, 1930s, you know, or depictions of Native Americans. Um, it was a Cowboys and Indians serial, uh, for want of a better term. Um, Mascot created this, and it was aimed at juvenile audiences. And so what they discovered was that these um, film series that tell a story over several serialized chapters, usually 13, sometimes 15, um, proved incredibly popular with the kiddies. Um, what they could basically do is take the, the types of genres that were popular in comic strips and comic books, like science fiction, and they could actually apply them to film for the kids. Um, but we come to Republic Pictures. Now, um, Republic is, in, in my mind, the most important film studio of movie serials. Um, and one of the most important uh, studios in terms of developing um, early genre for films, such as science fiction and, and so forth. Um, they, it was founded by Herbert Yates. Um, Yates was I mean, an amazing, interesting, possibly cutthroat guy. Um, he got into the tobacco industry as a copywriter when he was like 15 or 16. And he rose to uh, become assistant vice president of sales for Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company. And at the tender age of 35, was able to retire. 
<laughs> so he retired at 35 and uh, wasn't quite sure what to do with himself. So he decided to invest in film processing companies um, where you know, studios would basically take their film stock to get developed. He merged them into Consolidated Film Industries in 1915 during the silent film explosion. Many of the companies that employed him were on what's called Poverty Row. Um, it's a label slapped on these underdog studios that hastily churned out low-budget flicks and skated by um, the skin of their teeth. They were the low-budget film studios of the silent era. Um, Yates was a shrewd businessman, and his philosophy included never underestimate the power of good old-fashioned intimidation. So by 1934, he developed an idea to merge six Poverty Row studios, all small, low-budget companies, mind you, so they probably didn't you know, cost him much, into one more efficient and smaller-staffed company. He went after Monogram, Liberty, Majestic, Chesterfield, Invincible, and Mascot. He initially only got Liberty, Monogram, and Majestic on board. He coined the new company Republic Pictures and was eventually able to get Mascot shortly after. Um, Mascot, uh, he g gave him a, a wonderful sound serial department from founder uh, Ned Levine, who came on as head of production and would not stay long before resigning and moving on to MGM. On March 12, 1939, Yates officially bought the old Max Senate studio for $500,000. These are the stages in the back lot where Charlie Chaplin saw his career take off and flourish. Um, so they were really making films. Um, they were making films on a historical lot. So Republic, Republic did not have much money. All right, that, this is the one thing that I, I have to really underscore with them is that even though they had the, the smallest budgets, they had the best directors, best editors, and best stunt workers. Um, their, their two biggest directors were William Whitney and John English. Whitney was basically a kid when he started. He was in his early 20s. That's him right there. Uh, Whitney started as an extra in um, a movie serial at Mascot, his I think his brother-in-law had worked at Mascot, and uh, he basically wound up having to take over directing a film when the original director, uh, I think, it was suffering from alcoholism and couldn't finish it. And so Whitney, Whitney was I mean, he was a brilliant guy. He basically figured out what was not working about fight scenes in in uh, movie serials. And you have to keep in mind, these were for kids. So the, the fight scenes were like, um, they were such an important part of each chapter, right? That's where all of the action happens. The kids aren't going for dialogue scenes. They're going for fight scenes. And um, so a little snippet I wrote here. Whitney came to a conclusion about directing fights. The typical fight scene direction involved having the actors literally duke out the choreographed fight moves while the camera rolled. The results were sometimes a sloppy skirmish that didn't fool anyone and left the actors exhausted. If someone flubbed the fight while the camera was rolling, it could, if the director was motivated, lead to reshoots, which cost money from an already non-existent budget. A trip to the Warner lot to have lunch with a friend apparently led to Whitney's new approach towards directing fight scenes. Famed musical director Busby Berkeley um, was rehearsing a dance number with about 40 dancing girls. In between rehearsals and makeup touch-ups, he would call individual dancers over to the camera and have them do a specific step. At the end of collecting these close-ups, they ran through the entire dance number with the camera rolling. Whitney hung around and, and watched the rehearsal and filming the rest of the day. And I quote, I thought we should use the same technique on our fights. On the next picture, we started to choreograph our own fights. Each cut might be only 15 seconds. A punch, cut. A fall over a chair, cut. A charge into someone and over a desk, chuck, cut. Each time you saw cut in the lines above represents a close-up of one of the leads. The stunt people caught on fast. It made their work easier. A fall over a table could be done with precision, 
and without the chance of being off balance as they hit the table. Whitney's approach included extreme close-ups of fists hitting faces with the actors moving in slow motion while the camera recorded at normal speed, using about 16 frames per second rather than the 24. Because of these innovations, he has been considered the father of the action film, something also made possible through his experience before as a film editor. Um, so the important thing with the Republic's um, serials is that you had a director who figured out how to do um, the fight scenes in a more focused way, and he had the best stunt performers. I'll talk about a few of those. Now, how does Superman tie into this? Originally, Republic was going to make a Superman movie serial, but the rights fell through at the last minute. So they took the script, which was already written, and they uh, rewrote it into something called The Mysterious Dr. Satan. It was going to have an army of killer robots, but they could only afford one. I'm going to show you just a little bit of this awesomeness. You only had one. <laughs> I can only control this over the but we are in control. So, but the pundits like it all over the country. Dr. Satan may try to attack you on this train tonight. If he does, I want to be here. Dr. Satan. And why do you want to be here? Yes, you went to Dr. to obey his last time. I'm looking for a robot scene in the set. Okay, it's too grisly for me to show you anymore. Um, so uh, since they actually lost the Superman license, um, they wound up um, licensing um, Captain Marvel from Fawcett Publications um, using a lightweight mannequin to depict the flying. For those of you who do not know, you may know Captain Marvel more Shazam. Um, but back in the 1940s, Captain Marvel was Superman's biggest sales rival, sometimes outselling him. Um, there were actually a number of lawsuits between Detective Comics and Fawcett over the likenesses. Um, so Republic made The Adventures of Captain Marvel, which is really one of the best movie serials um, quite ever made. Um, I think it's one of the best superhero films. The star was a gentleman named Tom Tyler, who had been a competitive bodybuilder and a silent screen cowboy. He did many, many films and was very successful on the silent screen. Um, unfortunately, when talkies happened, he had, um, he had a Lithuanian accent. Um, and even with uh, coaching, he just was not comfortable in front of the camera, um, not with dialogue at least. Uh, he did play the mummy in The Mummy's Hand with Universal. Uh, and he also was the bad guy at the end of Stagecoach uh, by director John Ford um, and a young John Wayne. Wayne had been signed at Republic. Republic was also known for all of their low budget Westerns. So there is a little crossover. Um, there's a character named Whitey, played by William Benedict, who actually shows up in the comic book for a couple of stories. Um, you started to see this convergence um, between media. It didn't happen often, but it started to emerge in the superhero comics of the 40s with the movie serials. Um, most, more, most famously, the Superman radio show would have characters from, um, you know, like Jimmy Olsen and Perry White becomes, you know, standards in the comic. What's so unique about this is that Whitey 
actually appears in the Captain Marvel comic in kind of a weird quasi sequel to the movie serial. Um, they acknowledge that Whitey and Billy Batson made starting the movie serial of Captain Marvel. So it's kind of like this weird, like the, the comic book characters played themselves and then Whitey looped back around because they had to uh, save Mr. Malcolm um, from, from the serial, from the Scorpion. Um, but I'm going to show you a little bit of Captain Marvel here. Okay, I'm going to have to skip through, of course, because of time. All right, so that is, uh, that was an actual mannequin that they did for the flight. Um, let me kind of, okay, see that? So uh, the Lidecker brothers were these uh, genius special effects artists at Republic. And they made these balsa wood mannequins that were kind of, you know, arched up like that. And they had pulleys, wheel, like there were wheels right here. And they would basically just go down the line. Um, now, if Captain Marvel was flying upwards, what they basically do is it, it would back, you know, um, kind of go down backwards and they would then reverse the film. And then they use uh, Tom Tyler in front of a rear projection screen. Um, this is now keep in mind, Superman had not been committed to the big screen at this point, not in live action. There had been cartoons. So this is the first um, comic book live action comic book superhero. So again, keep in mind, this is the 1941 serial. So um, it is indicative of the time. Uh, so any, uh, you know, I mean, it's it, it's an artifact. So let's just kind of skip through a little bit. OK. So you're going to see the Captain Marvel um, cliffhanger and then how he gets out of it. Just going to skip forward because of time. OK. And that is a guillotine, by the way, because, you know, who doesn't have a guillotine on <laughs> a conveyor belt in their house? I mean, I've got one right in my office, but. So other things to remember, everyone in movie serials can fire a gun and fight. It's everyone. I don't know. It's just a thing. A little anticlimactic. And then we'll we'll just kind of skip forward. Yeah, Billy's got a bomb in his plane. No, Billy's dead. Okay, where is he? Come back next week. Um, I'm gonna have to go through the rest of these relatively quickly. Um, but another another very uh, excellent serial by Republic is Spy Smasher, which is another character from Fawcett. Um, they used the stunt work of Davy Sharp. So Davy Sharp was one of the best stunt performers at Republic. Um, they valued their stunt performers so so much that they would basically cast the main actor off of their resemblance to the stunt performer. And um, I want to show you a little bit of Spy Smasher here. This is another one of my favorite serials. It's a wartime one. And you'll kind of get a sense of a Republic fight scene. That's right. So what they would actually do is um, Whitney would work with each stunt coordinator and they would move the furniture to a certain point to ensure that, you know, they could make a specific leap. Um, 
The actor playing Spy Smasher is Kane Richmond. Uh, Kane was on his way to become a leading man, um, but he and his leading lady on a film um, eloped and put their honeymoon on the, uh, <laughs> they charged into the studio. <laughs> and uh, after that, he, he was down to being just a, um, working in movie serials, which was not really glamorous. Um, but just the, the flying leaps are just, you know, these are, and again, I tell my students, these were actual human beings. This, this is before, you know, CG. They didn't even have wire works, really. Um, these were actors just really, you know, getting into it. Um, so in 1944, Republic made a movie serial of Captain America. Um, it is nothing to do with Captain America. The character is named uh, a DA, Grant Gardner. Um, it has absolutely nothing to do with the comics. He carries a gun. He does not have a shield. Um, there was a theory that he was meant to be another superhero, but um, I kind of shot holes in that one um, just because there's no documentation and um, a bevy of other reasons that would, you know, um, I can't really get into. But what's funny about Captain America is that um, it's it's actually a great serial. Um, it's not the actor who plays Captain America is is a little out of shape. Um, he, he's not he, he's not uh, not a very heroic figure, unfortunately. Um, but the stunt performance is amazing. Um, So the, the, there's a thing actually called the dynamic vibrator that's going to shake the building apart. Um, this is from, this is the second chapter here. Okay, I don't know if he's gonna do any flying leaps, but this, uh, this stunt performer um, did these amazing kind of flying leaps off the wall. Okay, Wilhelm scream, and of course the, the the dummy falling off the side. That's another trope. These are not high art, but there's some real ingenuity in how they um, they were able to produce these. Um, and I'll show you some of the Lidecker's scale models here. So often they would use um, scale model shots like this. This this would probably appear in other movie serials as well. Um, and Cap just gets out, you know. Whoa! Oh, that was close. Okay. And now we're going to talk a little bit about Columbia. Um, Columbia was not the better of the two um, movie serial studios. Uh, they tended to have less money, um, and they also did not have quite the talent that Republic did. Um, in 1943, they produced a Batman serial, which was a wartime serial um, where the villain was a Japanese scientist named Dr. Daka. Um, this is, quite frankly, even by World War II standards, one of the most um, racist serials I've ever seen. Um, what's interesting about it, though, and uh, this actor, the first actor to ever play Batman, it's a guy named Lewis Wilson. I was very lucky to get his son for an interview. No one had ever asked his son to talk about his dad. His son is Michael G. Wilson, who's one of the James Bond co-producers. Um, so like three weeks after No Time to Die came out, I got to interview. I got to interview Michael G. Wilson, which was kind of cool. You know, it was just one of those moments where like I, I was reminded it never hurts to ask. Um, but the first serial uh, introduced um, the bat cave. They basically had a bat, like a cave set, Columbia lot that they just stuck bats in. And the bat cave pretty soon showed up in the uh, new comic strip released at the time of the serial, and um, also in the pages of Detective Comics in uh, number eighty-three. Um, another change that was affected was Alfred Pennyworth. Um, you know, not only do Bruce and uh, Dick go to the bat cave for the first time in the comics. But also Alfred, um, Alfred changed. Alfred Pennyworth was originally a more of a heavier set man. 
Um, they created him in the comics because the movie serial people were like, hey, we want him to have a butler. And then when the movie serial was cast, this was Alfred. William Austin, a very thin, reedy actor. So they did a storyline in the, uh, the comic book where Alfred actually goes to a health bar and loses weight. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're seeing one medium affect the other. Um, in 1949, they did a sequel uh, with uh, Robert Lowery as Batman, and it's awful. Um, at that point, um, there was a producer named Sam Katzman. That's him on the left with uh, Little Richard. Sam Katzman uh, was a cheapskate. He uh, would apparently uh, force movies in under uh, an already shoestring budget and just keep the profits. That's one one thing people suspect. He would bet on horses. He um, he he was kind of an awful guy in a lot of ways. Not a very ethical person, from what I hear. Um, after the movie serials, he went on to produce like early Elvis films and early rock and roll movies. Um, but in the meantime, he was producing with this great director named um, Spencer Bennett, that Spencer on the right. Spencer uh, did a stunt in Perils of Pauline and um, became a, an actor and a director of movie serials from the silent era on up into talkies. Bennett was a great director, technically. The thing with Bennett is he prided himself on coming in under budget. And so what Katzman would do is he would keep lowering the budget every serial. So basically, you had Bennett, who had directed for Republic, um, left making movies like this. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll show you just a snippet. We only have a few minutes. You're like, where's the plot? I don't know where the plot is, Batman. Where is it? I don't know, Robin. Uh, direction is just look around in a dark downstage. Okay. Okay, so let me show you the, the fight scenes. They're pretty special. Okay, they didn't have Davy Shark at Columbia. That there, folks, is some serious stunt work. Okay. Um, they did not have a good fight coordinator. Um, however, the good Katzman serial was Superman in 1948. Um, they, uh, they cast uh, Kirk Allen, who had a dancing background as the Man of Steel. Uh, um, that, that's not a padded suit, guys. He was in amazing shape. Um, he's actually one of my favorite Superman actors, um, but I love things old school. But they had a really interesting solution for the flying effects. Just take a look at the preview. It should be in here. Yeah, there we go. You see, they just... They did an animated Superman. Uh, yes, Secretary, a concrete blockhouse has been built in a western desert, miles from any habitation. I'd like you to see that test, Superman. The location is here. Hmm. That's about 2,000 miles away. I can be there in 30 seconds. Let's, let's wait. Uh, there we go. The stunts are the fun part, you know.
So what's interesting about the Superman serial is it's actually based off the radio show. The radio show ran from uh, 1940 to about 1951 and was how many people knew Superman, even over the comic strip or the comic books. Um, so they were when they were adapting Superman for media outside of the comic book or comic strip, they looked to the radio show, which I think is a, a really interesting um, twist. In 1950, they uh, did a sequel called Superman Atom Man versus Superman, um, very, very loosely based off a radio show storyline with Lex Luthor, played by Lyle Talbot. Um, personally, one of my favorite Lexes. If anyone has seen Ozzy and Harriet, he was the pesky neighbor. Um, so basically, the movie serials gave way to television. Right. Um, that took the kid audience away. Um, Robert Maxwell, who was head of Superman Incorporated, realized this early on and um, got the television show, The Adventures of Superman, off the ground, starring George Reeves, uh, which is a phenomenal show. If you haven't seen it, the first season is great TV. But what's so ironic about the first episode is this is the Council of Elders on Krypton who deny that global warming exists. Um, <laughs> we all know how that ends. Um, but they're wearing elements of movie serial costumes. Like he has Captain Marvel's tunic, that collar is from Flash Gordon. Um, some of these I don't recognize, but they're from different serials. You know, jor is wearing one of Flash Gordon's different uh, tunics. Um, so TV basically... Um, took everything out of serials. By the end, the final movie serial, which I want to say was 1956, Blazing the Overland Trail, um, used um, clips from other serials pieced together with stock footage and very, very little new footage of actors. Um, the director of the final movie serial was um, actually Spencer Bennett, who, again, came in on one of the first movie serials ever, and was the, the person to have the final word on the genre. Um, of course, we know movie serials nowadays as Star Wars, because George Lucas was trying to go um, kind of harken back to the Saturday morning matinees, in particular Flash Gordon. So um, I'm at about, we have about 18 minutes left, and I, I really wanted to leave enough time for questions. So um, please um, feel free to uh, ask away. Oh. Okay, this is a great question. Um, Bill Bridges, have you seen uh, J-Men Forever, the Fireside Theaters redub? Yes, Bill, funny story about that. Um, I have a friend named Patty Hawkins. Uh, he is a moderator at GalaxyCon, and, and I moderate for GalaxyCon. Um, a little less now since I'm working on a PhD, but I gave a copy of this book to, to Patty. He's like, have you seen J-Men Forever? that and so uh, i watched it which is on tubi for those of you who do not know jamin forever takes different movie serials and pieces them together and dubs over them with a little bit of new vintagey looking footage um as this wonderful piece of satire and it's amazing i love jamin um patty had wanted to talk to philip proctor who is one of the fire sign theater folks and so i emailed and he'd been trying for years and so i emailed philip and was like hey you know i wrote this book i would love to interview you for my podcast it's iwpodcast.com i have that up there and um we talked about it and philip's a very lovely guy i actually owe him a phone call i need to look, check up on him but yeah thank you bill um John Glover. Hey, John, my friend from the library, one of them. Thanks for the talk. Was it common for actors to cross over from the serials to other genres and back? I'm thinking here about Tyler's role in The Mummy's Hand and wondering whether actors in other genres enjoyed or actively pursued. Um, serials were not necessarily, uh, you didn't want to work in movie serials. Um, it, they were taxing. They didn't pay much. Um, there, but there were some actors like Lorna Gray, Kirk Allen, who made a living doing serials primarily. Um, with Tom Tyler, he—I um, don't know if the Mummy's Hand really would have been seen as 
a great role, you know, to have so much makeup, you can, uh, I think he could only move it like go three hours in his makeup for they had to take it off. So, it was so painful. And he was a tough guy, you know, he, he was a weightlifter and a cowboy uh, or an on screen cowboy, which still takes a lot. Um, I will tell you one actor who uh, started in movie serials and went on to other things was Leonard Nimoy. Right towards the end, he was in a serial. Um, the name's evading me right now, but um, I think it was a Commando Cody, but I could be wrong. Um, you know, uh, Clayton Moore, who played the Lone Ranger, started in the serials. He's in The Crimson Ghost playing um, playing like a mobster. It's in the pinstripe suit. And it's great hearing like seeing him without the mask and hearing him in that voice. Yeah, I'll shoot holes, shoot him full of holes, you know, like talking like a, a 30s gangsta. Um, it's kind of amazing. Um, but it was it was generally a dead end for people. William Whitney went on and did some second unit direction. Um, he filmed a few, made a few movies after, um, but he didn't really, you know, he, he didn't make the type of projects that he deserved to um you know many of them moved to television as well those are great questions well i want to thank you chris so much for the talk um and i'll just remind people that um you can submit additional questions we've got a little bit of time left um i'll give you a few moments to ponder on those questions, but you can feel free to drop them using the Q and a function. Um, but so I actually have a question myself of course. Um, because you mentioned a little bit about the physique of the actors. Yes. Um, and I was actually reading something the other day that was talking about the differences in physique between these kind of like older serials um, and the on-screen portrayals of them and, and how the type of physique for superheroes today just wouldn't have even been really legible at that time. Yeah. Um, and so I know this goes a little bit further afield from what you talked about, but I was wondering as people ponder their questions, what your, yeah. what your thoughts on that were? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it was a, a different time, right? Like, um, we are in the post bodybuilder world, you know, like the Schwartz and Akers and so forth. Uh, but I, I tell you, you look at, um, you look at uh, Buster Crabb who played Flash Gordon. He had been an Olympic swimmer. Buster was in amazing shape. I personally look at him and go, that guy's a superhero. You know, I, I, I never really felt superheroes needed to be like super kind of swole and muscles on muscles. But, you know, Crab, um, he did one of his last movie serials, uh, which I didn't talk about, was uh, King of the Congo. Um, and he's wearing a loincloth for most of it. And he's like, he must have been in his 40s. And he's still like amazing shape, right? Um, so you had people like him who were natural athletes. Kane Richmond was another one. Uh, um, <clears throat> I think that Kirk Allen was, you know, an exception because he was Superman, like Superman and Captain Marvel, you know, Tom Tyler. Um, by definition, they had to be kind of big, you know, and muscular. Um, but even then, by today's standards, um, I, I don't know how that would, would really be seen. Um, I, I would say... Um, to me, the what I love about the movie serial superheroes is that they're wearing costumes that, you know, are pre-spandex, right? Um, some of them are wool. They're actually, you know, real costumes. They look like they have weight to them. They look like they could function, right? Like Spy Smasher looks like he would be warm enough in his costume and he looks like he could actually, you know, kick some butt in his costume, you know? Um, it's not too for, they're not too performative. Um, you don't have like kind of your superhero poses that, that are just way out there nowadays. Um, there, there's not that, there's not like, I feel like there's more substance to the fights and there's more substance to kind of the actors they cast. I, I do think what's interesting is with George Reeves, you know, he wore padding. Um, and he was a big guy. But at that point, the su Superman was starting to appear more barrel chested in the comics. Uh, it's the Wayne Boring uh, artist, his model. Um, but, you know, I also think when we look at Christopher Reeve as Superman, 
know, Christopher Reeve was in a brilliant shape. Guy, he was like six four, maybe, um, and he was muscular, but he wasn't like swollen. You know what I mean? He was very limber and lithe. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I have different thoughts about superhero body types. I I think I like that the Marvel movies have, I think, had a little more variety in body types. I also like that they're not, um, their costumes, I, I think, are constructed in a way that just makes more sense. I'm not a huge fan of the, a, a lot of the crazy, kind of like the Zack Snyder era superhero costumes. Uh, that's some great design. Aquaman suit was amazing. Um, but like the fake sculpted on muscles on muscles, I think are just silly. You know, that's just yeah. me. You know, I love the Pattinson bat suit because it was, again, functional and it looked cool and you still had the silhouette. Um, I, I think uh, the, the thing also to remember with movie serials is they didn't have a table full of producers, you know, who were thinking of merchandising and sex appeal and appealing to an adult audience. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm more of a fan of that. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, oh, I have some. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, also, Tom Tyler played the Phantom. I didn't get around to say that, but he had a great Phantom. Um, yeah. Leland Hill with the animated flying scenes. Was there any connection with the Fleischer animated? Um, I would say they Fleischer did not. Fleischer did not make. Um, they did not actually do that animation. I can't remember offhand who did, um, but I'm sure if there was some influence. Um, I think the big difference is that the Fleischer cartoon, Superman cartoons, it, it, which I talk about in here, they're not serials, but I, I need to address them. The Fleischer era Superman animated shorts were made on a huge budget um, because the Fleischers didn't want to do them. So they asked for a lot of money and basically uh, they were given, you know, these huge budgets and they're like, well, crap, we've got to do it now. So they're really lush, beautiful um, movie serials. And um, I would uh, I would highly recommend everyone watch them if, if you have it. They're public domains. So you should be able to find them. Um, I'm having a little trouble finding the section here, but um, but it isn't the book. Believe it. Oh, here we go. Um, so yeah, the the Fleischer cartoons were just the Batman animated series um, of the uh, early '90s was based off of uh, Fleischer. Um, no, it's a great question. Um, Eric Johnson. Hey, Eric, uh, thanks for being here. You referenced George Lucas. Do you have any sense for his own opinions? You might say scholarship, where he and Spielberg truly tap into that tradition. Yes, there is a uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark is um, very similar to a Spencer Bennett Republic serial called Manhunt in Darkest Africa, um, which is uh, really great. Um, cause it's Bennett with, it was made during the war and, um, you know, it's, it's set in, in Africa, um, or I think it's the middle East actually. Um, but it is, uh, of course it has stereotypes, you know, because it's a wartime serial. It's not as bad as Batman, but it, um, it has a middle Eastern stereotypes. And of course it has Nazis. Um, but that's when I would recommend you check out because um, that's when we're really, uh, I think, Lucas and Spielberg took the most out of. Um, Bennett also, when he had the not time, money and editing, he did these great in your face shots where like actors, the, they would punch towards the camera. I love it. Love it. So, yeah, Manhunt in Darkest Africa is the one I'd look up. Um, Lucas had admitted in interviews, he's like, yeah, well, you know, I was doing Star Wars, and I look back on Flash Gordon and realize they were awful. Um, incidentally, when I teach science fiction class, uh, I'll show a chapter of Flash Gordon when I can, and the students love it. We all still mostly think he should have gone for Aura because she's just like this crazy goth girl with... Who's like, you know, she she like pulls a ray gun on people and, you know, she doesn't scream. She's amazing. And she's a daughter of Mink the Merciless and she still doesn't take any guff from anyone. But anyway, it's just. And if you haven't seen Flash Gordon, definitely watch the crap Flash Gordons. Um, Link. Oh, very good. Thank you so much. I'll see you at Galaxy Con 2. Uh, I will say with his focus on Star Wars, I actually. Um, I actually have uh, a, two classes on Star Wars that I teach. And we talk a little bit about this in the first one. 
Um, I'll say what Lucas did with Star Wars is reinvent the whole concept of a movie serial. Um, and when you look at it in, in context of the audience going to see Star Wars, these were people who grew up with the movie serials broadcast on television, right? Um, so in 1977, you're sitting in a theater, let's say you're 25, or in 1952, you would have seen Flash Gordon. Um, when it was re-released with, because uh, it originally didn't say Chapter 4, when it was re-released with a Chapter 4 at the uh, opening, beginning of the opening scrawl, um, I, I think it, it, in a weird way, kind of let, it, it tapped into a certain nostalgia that I don't think people want to acknowledge. There's a nostalgia for that original adult audience for the movie serials within Star Wars. And when you really look at Star Wars A New Hope, the acting, I describe the acting as their adults playing kids playing adults in outer space. Because the acting's a little silly, right? Like, they're great. But we think of the acting in the original trilogy as being amazing because of Empire Strikes Back, directed by Irving Kirshner. Um, not to say there's not great instances of acting, especially in Return of the Jedi by Mark Hamill and so forth. Um, but but yeah, I, I think kind of the golly gee tone um, and the, the absurdity of those movies, it really owes a lot to the movie serials. Um, I, I don't like Star Wars that takes itself too seriously and still tries to be escapist. Um, though, you know, Andor is brilliant if you haven't watched it, um, but that's not really like a serial. So yeah, I hope that answers your question in a very rambly way. <laughs> and um, if not, Link will see you at GalaxyCon for more answers. Yeah, so Link will hunt me down and I'll be at the end of a panel like, you didn't finish answering Irving. I'm like, I'm sorry, and I'll answer. Um, but there's a great book called the Star Wars Archive. They have two volumes. They were huge art books, but they do some smaller hardcover editions. They're like 30 bucks each. If you're a Star Wars fan, you, you should buy both of them. One covers the original trilogy, one covers the prequels. And they are on my, my shelf. And I, they were big Tash and art books, but these are just like the, the smaller editions. Seriously, he talks about all of that. Um, Bill Bridges, yes, Lyle Talbot's... Um, Son uh, is an author and founder of Slate.com. I tried to get him, but I was not able to, which is really unfortunate because Lyle Talbot is a brilliant Lex Luthor. Um, yes, so uh, Link, the name is the Star Wars Archive. And let me look that up real quick and I'll drop it in chat. Um, okay. Um, but yeah, it's like $27 on Amazon. So let me drop it in chat. And here you go. Um, yeah, yeah, Link. Well, I will be teaching Star Wars again. It's a very popular, uh, very popular um, class for the two classes. Um, the first one covers the classic and the second covers the prequels. Um, and I love teaching them. And again, they've been doing great. So Maybe not next year, but maybe the year after, if enough students demand it. All right. Well, that is very exciting. Um, so for any students here, you can look forward to those classes. Um, thank you again so much, Chris, for joining us. I think that wraps up the questions. And thank you, everyone who was able to join us today. I hope that everyone has a wonderful week. And we hope to see you um, either in person or on Zoom again in the future for our future Humanities Research Center events. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun.